It's not about the features. They asked me to talk a little bit about what's new in FlyQ EFB 2.0, and normally that would involve talking about lots of features, and we did. We certainly added lots of features, but that's really not the objective of this product. What we tried to do with EFB 2.0 was to accomplish three things. Number one, we had to make the product which we believe was already the best um, application out there in terms of usability and make it so much easier to use. You're really not going to believe how much better it is. Along with that, though, and I think more importantly, honestly, was to take much better use of the screen space that you have on the iPad. Previously, you'd have tab bars and toolbars and lots of stuff. Uh, when What you want to really focus on is on the maps and on the approach plate, um, on the airport information. So in 2.0, we put quite a bit of effort into getting much more space on the screen devoted to the content that makes you a safer pilot. We're pilots, too. So this is pretty important stuff to us. Number two, we tried to make the product much faster. In particular, you'll see startup time being faster, and I think this is the biggest thing, the mapping engine is about three times faster than it was before. It's a world of difference. If you're running this, especially on a, a newer iPad, an iPad Air 2 or something, you are just not going to believe how fast the thing is. Number three, we took an application that, and we see all the stats on this, has a very good reliability track record and made it absolutely world class. We spent three months and hundreds of beta testers testing this release, and we think it's spectacular. So I hope you agree, and now let's take a look at FlyQ EFB 2.0. So let's begin with the user interface improvements. The first thing that most people will probably notice is that there's no tab bar at the bottom of the screen most of the time. The tab bar was used in FlyQ EFB 1.5 and all previous versions to jump between different parts of the app the map, the airports, the procedures, flight plan, whatever. The reason why they're not there anymore is because most of the time you don't need them. Most of the time you're looking at a map or at airport information or a procedure. So then the question is, how do you switch between different parts of the app? And the answer is remarkably simple. Simply tap anywhere at all and it appears for a few seconds. After a few more seconds, about six of them actually, it fades away. Of course, while it's visible, you can use it to tap to go to different sections and so on. But the point is, once you tap the screen, if you don't do something, it simply goes away. No further intervention required. In settings, you can change that, by the way. You can make it stay on the screen longer or shorter, or you can even make it stay permanently. In other words, behave exactly the way that FlyQ EFB 1.5 did. So the problem is even worse when you're in split-screen portrait mode. Now, if you take a look at the top half of the screen, you can see that there's not a lot of space on the procedure view to actually look at the procedure. There's a lot of space taken up by tab bars and toolbars and so on. In fact, let's take a look at that. So that's the blue area right there. Keep that in mind. Below the blue area, looking at the map now, even the map doesn't have a lot of space to actually display the map. There's a window popping out on the right-hand side. The toolbar that shows you how to change different things on the map is on the left-hand side. And there's the gauges down the bottom and the tab bar below that. In other words, even in the map view down below, there's simply not a lot of space to display the actual map. Now, keep your eyes on that blue box. Now, this is version 2.0. On V2, you can see just how much more screen space you have to look at that approach plate. It's quite a lot when you make things fade away. And if you look at the map, the map is now super clear. No more cluttered windows or things like that. A lot more space. In fact, take a look at them side by side. FlyQ EFB 1.5 is on the left and EFB 2.0 is on the right. I think you can see that there's a tremendous difference in the amount of space available to actually look at the content you care about, the maps and the plates, and not look at tab bars and toolbars and things like that that you don't need most of the time. Status indicators. It's very important when you're flying to know if your GPS is working properly, how old your weather is, if your ADSB is working properly, and so on. In FlyQ EFB 1.5, we did have that information on the screen right there, but you had to flick it off or flip it down, flick it up, whatever you wanted to do. And a lot of people, since it took a lot of space on the map view, got rid of it most of the time, which means that they didn't see the status information most of the time. And even if you did, that status window was glued to the map. So if you flip to the approach procedure or scratch pad or flight plan, whatever it, it may be, that information wasn't visible at all. We think that was a problem. So in FlyQ EFB 2.0, we got rid of that, and instead, in the upper right corner, we put in this indicator right here. It has actually all the same information, in fact, twice as much information, in four small colored bars that are easy to see at a glance. 
and they're visible no matter which tab page you're on. So airports or map like this, procedure, whatever, it's always visible, always available. Let's drill down and look at that a little bit more closely. You have an indicator that says GPS on the far left, it's green, meaning your GPS is good. Next to that is an indicator that's yellow for weather, meaning that you have weather, but it may be a little bit dated. Of course, you want that to be green. Next to that is a whole new indicator about ADSB. The ADSB indicator lights up green when you are connected to an ADSB system. Incidentally, if you're never connected to an ADSB, like many people fly without one, that won't be red. We only use the red for the ADSB to indicate that you were connected to an ADSB, but you disconnected. In other words, we want to make sure that you, your eye is not drawn to this area uh, by always seeing a red bar there just because you don't have an ADSB receiver. Okay? If you don't have an ADSB receiver at all connected, the ADSB uh, indicator is simply clear. Similarly, next to the ADSB indicator is another one that says ADSB, but if you look closely, it looks like a little battery on top. That means you see the ADSB battery status for your clarity or your uh, dual. Any system that has a battery other than a Stratus will show you the, st the battery indicator right there. If you want more detail than that, simply tap on any of the four. It doesn't matter which. You don't have to be precise. So for that first tap, we take a look at the detailed information for the GPS. One thing that's new is we tell you what the source is of the GPS information, whether it's coming from the iPad or from an ADSB receiver. That's also how you turn on the GPS simulator that now uh, has been moved to over to here. Below the GPS section, you notice that there are three tabs on the left-hand side. It's weather. If you tap on weather, we give you, again, a weather detail about when it was last updated, what the source of the update was, and then for each weather product, Nexrad, Satellite, METARS, TAFs, Winds Aloft, Airmets and Sigmets, we tell you the age of the data and also if that particular data product came from an ADSB receiver or was downloaded from the internet. Very important to know. Below weather is a button that says ADSB. When you look at that, it tells you again the battery status of whatever you're looking at. It tells you how old the last update was. And then you have a lot of information. In fact, it's a scrollable area on the screen. What you do basically here is it tells you when the uh, last weather update happened, when the last traffic update happened, when the last GPS update happened, and the number of ADSB ground stations. In this case, four. If you scroll that down a little bit, you can actually see that. We show you the relative position and distance of the ADSB ground stations compared to your aircraft. And if you scroll that a little bit more, you get even more information, like what is the closest station, what is the farthest station, what model number of receiver are you using, like in this case, the Clarity, what's the software version of the Clarity, what's the serial number of the device, and so on. So a lot more information is available simply with a tap. All that you have to do, no matter what you're looking at on the screen, is tap on any of those four indicators, and you can immediately see a wealth of status information. To get rid of it, just tap anywhere else on the screen. In other words, tap off the pop-up gauge bar. The gauge bar position in FlyQ EFB 1.5 was at the bottom of the screen. In EFB 2.0, it's at the top of the screen. Why? A couple of reasons. The main one, though, is because a lot of people put the iPad on their knee. If you're trying to, while flying, crane your neck to look down enough to see the gauge, uh, that's often very difficult. So it's much easier to see, especially when it's on your knee, as I said, when they're at the top. That's why we move them to the top. By the way, the way that you get the gauges on and off is no longer flipping them out, flipping on, flipping off. Uh, that whole slide in, slide out thing just didn't really work, we don't think. So we got rid of all of those windows in FlyQ EFB 2.0. Therefore, the mechanism to show or hide the gauges is something new. In the lower left corner, you see a button that I circled here. That's a button that looks like a circular gauge. Tap that on, tap it off to turn the gauges on or off. Let's talk about the map bar. The map bar is the thing that controls the layers. It has a button for the GPS lock, has a button for north up versus track up, and for 3D uh, versus 2D. In FlyQ EFB 1.5, it's in the upper left corner of the screen. The problem with that, however, is this. You see, those two buttons are very close to each other. The layers button is the most commonly hit button in the product. Unfortunately, it's just below the split screen button. So what ends up happening to a lot of people, and it's happened to me as well, is I was trying to hit the layers button, and by mistake I hit split screen. You really don't want to do that while you're flying. 
So what we wanted to do was we wanted to get some physical separation between the layers in the split screen. We did that in Fly QEFB 2.0 by moving them as far apart as possible. Now, the uh, bar that controlled the map bar is no longer horizontal and towards the top of the screen, but is actually vertical towards the bottom of the screen. We did that so that you don't hit split screen when you meant to hit layers. The reason why we made it vertical, though, as opposed to horizontal, is this. You, right now, you're looking at Fly QEFB running in standard north up configuration. But one other change we made in EFB 2.0 was when you're in track up, like this. Now, the aircraft position is moved towards the bottom of the screen, giving you a lot more screen real estate uh, looking forward. That works great, but if the map bar had been horizontal, it would have actually run into the aircraft. So we needed to make sure that there was some physical separation between the tab bar, between rather the button bar, and the aircraft icon. So that's why those two things moved. In terms of finding information, we pride ourselves on finding information quickly. We call it the rule of two. But in the case of NOTAMs, it was actually pretty hard to find. The NOTAMs were always in the weather briefing, either about a particular airport or the weather briefing you get when you create a flight plan. Still, we wanted that to be a lot easier. It's a whole new tab for every airport, and it very clearly shows you the expiration date, the effective date, uh, NOTAM ID number, and of course the NOTAM itself. In plain text, easy to read. Performance improvements. There's a lot of performance improvements in this version of the product, and probably the best way to do that is to show you some video, both from FlyQ EFB 1.5, and then on the same device, FlyQ EFB 2.0. Before we begin the video though, let's just take a look at the difference in the quality of the maps in version 1.5 on the left, and version 2.0 on the right. As you can see, everything is much clearer, much sharper, much easier to read on version 2.0. So it's really not just about the speed of the map, it's about the quality and legibility of the maps as well. Now let's take a look at the video between the two versions of the product. On the right is version 2.0. As you can see, the frame rate is much smoother and the maps render quite a bit faster. Reliability improvements. Nothing is more important when you're flying than making sure that everything works properly. So let's talk about some of the changes we made here. We made a lot of changes for ADS-B. FlyQ EFB supports at least 15 different ADS-B receivers. In fact, I think it's more than that. And we made a lot of changes to make it work better. We fixed a particular bug that had to do with the Stratus 1 receiver. We made sure that the Stratus 1S and 2S, which are relatively new devices, work properly with the product. We fixed a problem that when you're flying over 30,000 feet with some devices, we've shown incorrect altitude. A lot of folks complained um, properly that the AHAR's alignment on pitch wasn't correct. It didn't match the terrain on the ground. It wasn't technically a bug, but it wasn't something that was uh, intuitive to people. So we made sure that the AHAR zero point matches the uh, line that you see on the ground. We put a lot of work into increasing the reliability of the Nextrad and the METAR TAF updates. Those sometimes were problems. And for most of the ADS-B receivers with a battery, we now show you in the status window the battery life indicator, which we think is a pretty useful thing to have. This is by far the best tested version of FlyQ ever. We fixed dozens and dozens of bugs. Some of them were crashing bugs, and some of them were just annoyances or presenting data in a way that wasn't completely intuitive. We used hundreds of beta testers to do this. We did this, in fact, over the course of more than three months of beta testing. That's what's new in FlyQ EFB version 2.0. We think it's a terrific update, much easier to use, much more information that you care about on the screen, performance dramatically improved, and uh, the testing and the reliability of it also improved. That's FlyQ EFB from Seattle Avionics version 2.0. Thank you.